Okay, now that you're all alarmed, and I've made a complete moron of myself, <laughs> a complete idiot, and all of you are going to go home and go, I went to see Milov's Q&A. He was coming on stage, and the fat fucker fell. <laughs> Just fell right on the stage. Well, how old is he? 90? What the heck is going on? Should have seen it. I think the stage broke. So anyway, you can feel free and just go on from there. Just, you know, make it. In fact, what happened was there was a hole then. He created a hole. And he came, he went down through the hole and came out through the bottom and, you know, blood everywhere. It's a good story. I like it. I'm telling that story. I was in Pittsburgh. I fell on the stage. There's blood everywhere. So anyway... Just for those of you who don't know, my name is Meatloaf, and um, it's two words, which is obvious if you look at an album cover, but some people just don't get that sometimes, and it's not, we didn't sit around a table and try to come up with a stage name, you know? Let, let's see, how about Chop Suey? Nah, nah, that's not good. Nope. Between the ages of three and ten days old, I was born bright red in Dallas, Texas. My father was a Dallas policeman, a true redneck in all sense. Um, and he probably said something like this, My son looks like nine and a half pounds of ground chuck. You nurses, what I want you to do is I want you to make up a sign. On that sign, it's going to say meat. And you're going to put it in front of that little crib right there in the nursery. Sir, we can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. I'm a Dallas policeman. You have to do everything I say. So I don't know if that's what he did. I understand I'm comedy, and I go on from there, and I bring in two other ladies, and oh, my God. So anyway, and then I, uh, I do another one. And I, right now, I can't remember what the other one is. How crazy is that? So anyway, it must be from the fall. That's it. I'm having amnesia from the fall. Who am I? So, um, so, and that's true. They, I have a picture of the crib in the nursery in the Dallas Baylor Hospital in Dallas, Texas, and on the front of it, it says meat. Now, the loaf came about, you got to remember that as I went through, you know, growing up and going to school, not everybody called me meat. My dad called me meat neighbor down the street called me I had a third grade teacher thought it was the greatest thing in the world meet you here today so and so it was off and on you know and but you got to remember the coach football coach eighth grade they knew the name meet so I stepped on his foot with cleats and he goes he's screaming get off my foot you hunk of meat oh you hunk of meat oh you hunk of meatloaf and all the kids thought it was funny came into my locker the next day there it was. Meat, space, loaf. Two words. So feel free, any of you, to call me Mr. Loaf anytime you'd like. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, that's the first question I get asked all the time. How'd you get your name? Oh, good Lord, okay. And now, the next question, which came about in 1993, it started. And <clears throat> the question is, what is that? Yeah, right. <laughs> you laugh. Okay. So anyway, we're sitting and we're listening to it, the track, after it's recorded, before I decided I wanted to redo the vocal, which I did. And Jim, ever go, what are you talking about? I said, I'm redoing the vocal. I don't like it. And I, and I did it. I did it really quick. And uh, for an 11-minute song, I did it in about 45 minutes, which is not bad in the studio. Um, so, especially with that melody. Are you kidding me? And so, anyway... Jim's going, I don't think they're going to know what that is. I said, what do you mean, Jim? He goes, they're not going to know what that is. I said, of course they're going to know. What do you think, the world is stupid? You think all these people are just out there, don't know what they're doing? He goes, they're not going to know. I said, I'll bet you $20. I had to pay him $20. <laughs> Turned out the world was stupid. <laughs> not really, but I understand why people didn't know what that was. Okay, now that, 
is not what you think it is, okay? I know what you, people, you guys are out there thinking, all you dirty guys out there thinking, I know what it is. No, you don't. So anyway, um, it's, it's the lyric before every chorus, like, I'll never stop dreaming of you every night of my life. I never do it better than I do it with you. Um, what's, um, what's the first verse? Anyway, there's more. Do you know what the others are? Oh, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. So anyway, there's, I think, a total of seven different lyrics in the record. I was going to look it up on the Internet, but I didn't sleep. You ever been so tired you can't sleep? You're like, and, you, and you're vibrating. You feels like you're in a massage bed. That's what happened. Because we, I flew from Nashville. My wife goes, look, the only nonstop is on Southwest, and we can get there in an hour and 20 minutes. I said, okay. So we get on. They're a little late, taking off, no big deal. Get up, and we're flying, and we start to... We go beneath the cloud, and all of a sudden, I'm looking around there. I don't get scared on planes very often, and there's lightning. And the first rule, it's like the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. First rule of flying is you don't fly in a thunderstorm. And, that, and all of you were here last night, so that's what's going on. We come down, and there's lightning everywhere, and I'm going, what are they doing? And we're bouncing like crazy. I don't care about the bounce, but the lightning was freaking me out. And we landed. And, okay, God, we land. Okay, fine. We sat on that tarmac for almost three hours. I was in that stupid Southwest Airlines seat for four hours. And after four back surgeries, that is a horrible place to be. And you can't get up and walk around. It's this little size of a shoebox. And... It was not, the flight was fine except for the lightning, but sitting on the tarmac was stupid. And there was all these other planes, and the pilot goes, we land, he goes, it'll just be like 20 minutes or so. They got open on the gate, and they're having, they don't want the people to come out on the runway when the lightning, okay, that's cool, I understand that. I wouldn't want to go out there either. Oh, that's okay, well, let's take this back. <laughs> so, uh, right, you've been there, haven't you? Were you on the runway last night? So, anyway, Hey, wait, don't you have a question before you go? <laughs> what, did I bore you? What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> what? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, see, that, where the hell do you think you're going now? <laughs> Are you with them? Huh? Are you, are you shaking your booty at me? Is that what you're doing? Think that'll get you out of here okay? So anyway, thank you. He paid me a compliment before he left. He goes, oh, God, I got to give him a compliment. You were great in Masters of Horror. Okay. I was. I mean, he's you ever seen that Masters of Horror? Oh, my word. So anyway, where was I? I was telling this last night, sitting on the runway. So the pilot goes, and then I'll go Masters of Horror. The pilot goes... Uh, don't worry about it. You'll get 20 minutes and we'll be in. And we sit there and in half hour, 45 minutes, nobody's saying anything. And all of a sudden he comes back. He goes, well, we just, you know, I know I told you half hour, or 20 minutes, half hour, but there's been a little bit more delay. There's, I just want you to know that we're not the only plane here. There's four other planes here, but don't worry about it. We'll be there within very short time. Nobody talked to us for two hours. And then he comes out and goes, listen, I'm really sorry. And they let every other plane up except us. There was like, the pilot was being penalized for something. I don't know what. So anyway, we sat there. It was horrible. Do not fly Southwest Airlines in a thunderstorm. That's my, that's all I'm saying. Now, Masters of Horror, you, you've seen it, right? Who, who has seen it? Raise your hand. Ooh, a lot of you. Okay, in the Masters of Horror Pelts, it's called. It was directed by a guy named Dario Argento, who's one of the premier Italian horror directors. I mean, he's, if you get a chance to work with Dario Argento, people are begging to work with this guy. 
So they wanted me to do the project, the producers. And so we already had the offer, and I hadn't signed the contract, but the offer was there. I said, yes. We were, I turned down something else to do this. I'd rather do that than that. And then all of a sudden they go, my agent calls up and said, they want to just talk to you on the phone. I said, oh, okay. So I'm talking to the producer, and he said, do you, um, do you watch horror movies? I went, oh, God, no. Are you kidding me? Oh, man, I can't watch them. I get scared to death. And he goes, well, have you ever been to one? I said, well, I went to see The Exorcist on 42nd Street because that's where you wanted to go because it was an African-American audience, and they screamed at the screen, why, well, get out of there, bitch. What you doing? <laughs> so um, it was, uh, I'm not trying to be rude. I mean, that's what they did. I'm just And so... And if you want to see a horror movie, go to 42nd Street. Now it's Disney, so. And I saw The Exorcist there because everybody was talking about it. And the lines, the lines to see The Exorcist back then were so long. And I go, I wouldn't stand in line for food that long. And I weighed about 300 pounds. So anyway, Pelts, and the, he keeps asking me about horror movies. And I'm going, why is he asking me this? And and so he goes, okay, thanks. And um, we hang up, and I get a call back. The agent says, um, they're questioning you doing it now. I said, well, we have an offer. He goes, I know. He goes, but Dario Argento was on the phone when you were just talking to him, and he's not sure because you don't like horror movies that you can do the part. And I said, well, let's call him back. And I said, make sure Dario's on the phone, and I want to talk to him. So I said to him, I said, just because I don't go see horror movies has nothing to do with me playing the character in the script, in the film. I said, one doesn't correlate with the other. And I said, I have no idea what that character's gonna do yet, but I know that he's there and he'll do it. And so Dario was, they went ahead and I got there, first day, doing a scene with Dario in this room and, he, and I do it and so he comes to me later and he goes and I'm trying to do my Italian I can't get it uh, off, you know I give you uh, and so no he doesn't talk like that that's the godfather so anyway um, <laughs> but he said and it, just picture it with an Italian accent he said uh, you know I doubted you and I'm sorry because that last scene was great and I'm so glad you're here I said, well, I'm glad I'm here, too, and I'm really, it's a pleasure and an honor to work with you. Now, in that film, there is a scene where I make a skin vest for the girl I'm trying to impress. I guess it was a stripper, right? She was a stripper? I can't remember exactly, but I think she was a stripper, and I'm trying to impress her with a skin vest. Oh, that'll do it every time. Your, your skin, giving her your skin with blood. Oh, yeah, your hair. And so, I, I mean, I lock in the scenes. And when I, if I know in a film and I'm doing a scene and I know what just happened, the minute it ends before some lighting guy or somebody can say something, oh, I bored you, I'm sorry. So anyway, don't walk out of here. You think you're getting out of here that easy? You're out of your mind. So anyway... Let's go ahead, leave. Just be that way to all of us. They're, look at how, they're just, oh, God. So, anyway, what was I saying? I forget. Anyway, uh, what? Skin the vest. skin vest. Skin yeah, vest. the skin vest. But in a scene, if I know what I'm doing, I finished, I'll go one more before anybody can say anything. And I, 98% of the time I get it before some lighting guy comes, oh, I just got to need it. And I'll get the retake. And it doesn't make any difference. So, and I did that, and I was so far into that skin thing, I know that there was pain involved. Me sitting here now, I didn't have it, but that character really had it. And when the scene was over, me, I, the character, 
collapsed on the floor, just collapsed. And there was, a, uh, I guess, a, a physician or a nurse next to me, and they had paramedics there, and, and I was gone. And they, 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 it was one take. And they moved on, camera was gone, I think. So finally, I, I came to and I go, we're doing another one? It was like 30 minutes later. They go, no, they're gone. I said, well, why? We got to do another one. And they go, no, I don't think you need to do another one. And so I went down there and I went, Dario, he goes, unbelievable, with another Italian accent, unbelievable. Um, I said, really? He goes, I said, are you sure? Because actors are paranoid. The most paranoid actors I ever worked with was Michelle Williams. Wonderful lady, enjoyed working with her, but every time we shot a scene, she would go, was that okay? I mean, I didn't even have a chance to ask her, was that okay? And she's going, was that okay? I go, Michelle, I think so, I don't know, because I don't remember doing it. She goes, what do you mean? I go, I don't remember doing it, so it must have been okay. Because it wasn't okay, I would remember doing it. She goes, really? I go, yeah. So that was all, and even if I wasn't in the scene with her, she'd do a scene, come down to me, was that okay? I go, Michelle, everything's great. And so now after I've told you those stories, I'm going to answer your questions. And I really look forward to it. Okay? Just raise your hands and we'll come around and got one right over here. And I hope you enjoyed my stories. Hi. Hi. My question is, um, whose idea was it and what does it mean to have the Roman numeral four on the Hank Cool Teddy Bear album? On the back of it, you know, like the Roman numeral four. Oh, because, oh yeah, I do know now, thank you. Because um, that was on the front, wasn't it? On the building on the, on the side or did, would we put it on the back? Oh, uh, well, it, to me, it was bad at a health four. And that, that is a, in, an entity into itself, it's like godlike. So there's Bat, then there's a record called Bad Attitude, which I think is incredible, and then there's Bat 2, and then we go all the way to Hank Cool Teddy Bear, and we come back to Welcome to the Neighborhood. And then huh, the last record, I do, I sing everything in character. Every song I've ever sung is in character. And again, like I say about doing a scene, if I know what's happening when I'm singing it, I'm not doing it right. So I finish it, I don't know. And so the characters always bar in my voice. So on the last record, Braver Than We Are, I didn't change, I'm famous for changing Jim Steinman arrangements, trust me. The only one I didn't touch was for crying out loud. And ha well, I did touch him away. Crying out loud, I didn't touch, except for the very end when I went up high. And um, so I had all these gym songs. Now, I could have changed the arrangements and changed the keys and did all this, and I decided not to. I didn't want to change, because he was very sick at the time. So I didn't want to change any of his arrangements or work. I did on the very last song, just eh. And, and I also decided that the characters were not going to borrow my voice. I was going to find their voice. And that was difficult and very hard. Um, took me a long time to do a lot. It was a lot harder than them borrowing my voice, trust me. And so when it was over, everybody was compliment. They knew what I'd done. And people that know how I do things, they were going, it's amazing. How did you find all that? And there was one thing that kept going, but you need to change, there's a little thing, it's about a minute and a half long, and the guy's not singing it very well. And I know it's weird talking about another guy, but he's not. And people go, why aren't you gonna change that? I go, no, that's him, that's, he did that. Well, can't you get him to do it over? And I'm going, no, and so it's not very good, but that's, that's the guy. And so that was all sung in character in Jim Steinman keys, Jim Steinman arrangements. It was 
true to the to the it's like being a character true to the script it was true to it and it was an artistic choice that I thought was amazing and then I had all the back problems and there was a arena tours booked all over the world and so from my point of view doing it that way was like doing better to hell because nobody understood it nobody got it I said when I take it out on stage and I start to perform it people are gonna get it because they were getting it we were doing little supper clubs in New York for 60 people and 60 people at a supper club go oh that's very nice oh isn't that nice oh Steve isn't that great and um, they were not doing that they were going yo man rocking you know and it's like weird to see some lawyer on the east side uh, oh man so that's what was going on we played Carnegie Hall sold at Carnegie Hall before better to hell was ever even thought about recording and um, it was very interesting Beverly D'Angelo was one of the background singers she was my girlfriend at the time um, I had weird girlfriends so uh, Marsha McLean, soap opera girl, Ellen Foley, Beverly and Angelo, oh, it goes on. Elizabeth Taylor, no, so, anyway, that's, and, but braver than we are, if I could have taken it out on tour, people would have understood it, because I would have sung anything for love like meatloaf, and then I would have gone over here and sung something from braver than we are in, in that way. And, but I never got that chance, and people didn't get it and understand it, and people go, Oh, if you, Amazon. Oh, I hate this. Um, uh, okay. So, you know, sometimes you have to live with it as an artist. It is what it is. And that's how it goes. Anybody else got a question? Please? Okay, come on down. I feel like that guy on, what's that? Price is right. That's it. Come on down. Keep coming. Come on down. Are you, are you going to perform anymore? I, listen. Oh, God. Do I want, and you have no idea. I, I sit and I, that's all I want to do. I, and that's all I think about. That's truly, and I had a show that was going to go up in Clearwater, Florida at Ruth Eckert Hall. And we had the guarantees. We had the whole thing worked out. And I backed out because when COVID hit, I was, my PT sessions were going great. I traveled to Germany, sorry about that. Traveled all over everywhere and did a commercial in the UK and got in trouble talking to some reporter who turned my words around, but it wasn't my fault. So anyway, so if you read that about that little girl that, the, that does the, what is it? Echo, whatever her name is from Sweden. Greta, yeah. I thought she was 13 and I couldn't understand why her father let her go out there like that. Turned out she was 16 and I said, I thought she was 13 and what I said was, I, as her father, I, if I was her father, I don't believe in that. So what did they say? Meatloaf doesn't believe in climate change. What? What are you talking about? I didn't say that. Yes, you did. It's written right here in the Daily Mail. Right. I said I didn't agree with Greta's father sending her out. But then I come to find out that Greta's mother and father are paid, and they go with Greta, and they have their own private jet. And, she, and it's like she's got her own jet, and it's climate change. Put two and two together, and that doesn't come out to four. So anyway, I believe she believes in what she's saying, but everybody around her doesn't. So I believe she's very honest. And, but the Daily Mail writer, like many people in the press, are fucked up. Excuse my language. So I don't know what I was talking about other than that. But I love, I love your costume. You, right there. Is that a wig, a blonde-haired wig with a costume? Who are you? I've been, I can't take my eyes off you. Can't take my eyes off. Uh -oh. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Toga from My Hero Academia. That's your character's name? <laughs> yeah, my name's Mackenzie. Hi, Mackenzie. 
Well, you look fabulous, and I can't take my eyes off, and you're a beautiful young woman. Oh, my God, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I mean, it's it, true. You just, uh, I, every, I go over here and I come back around and I stop. People are talking to me and I'm, oh, man. So I had to talk to you. All right. Somebody came down and had a question. Come on. Right behind you. No, nope, right here. He came running down all the way from the back. So in the original cast of Rocky Horror Picture Show of the musical, uh, you played Eddie and Dr. Scott. Correct. Did, did they suggest um, you to play Dr. Scott in the film? Not originally, and I, I didn't tell them that I should play Dr. Scott, even though I thought I should. Not because I'm better than Jonathan. Jonathan is a really good actor. But when you do Eddie and you do Dr. Scott, Dr. Scott goes into Frankenfurter's lab with this urgency about him that he has to find Eddie. That's, that's his sister's son he's got to find him he's the only one that can and there's a real sense of urgency he does when you first come out as dr scott you don't play that with frankenfurter because you you can't you have to be well we meet at last you know you have to be as tough as he is although when you in the end you're not because you're wearing fishnet stockings and high heels <laughs> and when <laughs> tim is the from Tim Curry, they, you're taught as an actor from day one. You have to be in the moment. And to explain in the moment to you is very simple. When you have a conversation with anyone, you're listening to them, you reply. That's what in the moment is. You don't know what that person is going to say to you next. So you reply without knowing. And that's what an actor has to do. You have to totally lose yourself in the scene so that it's all original. Every, you're listening to that actor and you reply back to him. Thus, all the actors that sit around going, so, I saw you last night. No, that's not good. I saw you last night. No, that's not right. <laughs> I saw you last night. Nah, that sucks. I saw you last night. No, that's wrong. It's, that's, you've seen all that. You hear, uh, that's so wrong. And I'm on set with that. I've seen actors do that going, oh, Lord. You don't do that. You know your lines. You know what the intention is. But you don't know how to reply until the other actor talks to you. Or you talk to the other actor. So I was one of those actors up until working with Tim Curry that sat around and went, well, Frankenfurter, we made it last. No, that sucks. Frankenfurter, we made it last. No. Third show. And in rehearsals, he always did it the same way, so it was fine. Third show in, he said he had the first line about Dr. Scott, something. Dr. Scott, we made it last. And I just, and he did it completely, completely different. And I'm going, Oh my God, if I say my line the way I've been saying it, I'm going to look like the biggest idiot in the world. And it felt like I was sitting there for an hour. And so I just replied to him. And I don't know what I said or how I did it. But I learned right then what being in the moment was. That's what being in the moment is. You listen and you reply accordingly. Duh. You know, and I, what, for 10 years I've been hearing, okay, you're in the moment. Oh, yeah, I'm in the moment, man. I'm always in the moment. You can't, I'm always right in here. The director, you got to be in the moment. I got it. I'm in the moment. I learned that in 67. No problem. Tim Curry taught me different in 1974, trust me. So I am the actor I am because of Tim Curry, and I give him full credit. We got time for one more question oh, for no, you. We got time for as many questions as they want to ask me. <laughs> Don't pay any attention to this. I got time for one more number. You got questions? Just come up behind him right now and stand in line. Any question you got. Anybody wants to ask a question. If you so, stand in line, I'll answer your question. If not, you're screwed. <laughs>
Okay, go. So you once described um, working with Jim Steinman as in that he was Peter Pan and you were Tinkerbell. I believe that that was the quote. Well, originally, we were doing, we were doing, it was called Neverland. And that was the musical. And Jim wrote the character Tink for me. So I was Tink. He thought, I got a 300 pound Tink. Good, you know, very cool. So yeah, it was, I was Tink. And Tink had this most incredible scene. He, was, he was, had a conversation with a car in a junkyard and talking about how the, you, know, you have to be Jim Steinman, how the car enjoyed being metal and he wished he could get out. He wanted to become a gun. Ooh. And it was, it was creepy and Jim meant it to be. And Jim meant it to be on the other side, you know? So, and it was a wonderful, wonderful scene. And then I just became oh, too old to play Tink. <laughs> Very sad, but that's okay. So, and, and Jimmy wasn't, Jimmy was at the time was very ill when they were putting the musical up in London because that's where it went up first. And I, I have 70 emails from Jim. Me, you got to go to London. Me, you got to go now. I send Barry Keating, but no, you got to go. I'm going, Barry Keating? Okay. So, and um, I, it's on and on. Me, you got to go. Call me up. Me, please go. Because later on about Oh, four years before he died, he couldn't talk anymore. So when he could still talk, he would call me and say, me, you got to go. I said, Jim, I can't go. We're doing Vegas. How am I going to go? And uh, I finally went, and I said, I'm going. And I, you know, he get, gets back to his nurse. Great. You know, okay, tell me what you think. So... I did, through his nurse, I, I talked to him on the phone, I said, this needs to change, that needs to change. Typed out, change it. Yeah, cool. So I went to producers, I go, we're gonna change all this. Well, we gotta get permission from him. I said, you got it. And uh, so I went in and I actually took out a song that is no big deal. Jim didn't care that much about it. They put it in, Jim didn't. And I took out a song in the first act and I made it, uh, the storyline, they lost the storyline, and that's one thing Jim would have hated. And uh, I made sure that this, I mean, the storyline is kind of this way, but I made sure that if you came in and didn't really, you knew kind of offhand, oh, I kind of know bad out of hell or whatever, that you would understand the storyline and what it was all about. And so I corrected that, and Jim was very happy. And so were the producers, actually. And so were the actors. That's who counts. And the audience was, I guess. So anyway, got good reviews. So that's all that counts. So what, especially for us, good reviews are hard to come by. Go ahead. <laughs> so what is it l like working with a person who would write a script for a person that is like screaming at a car? <laughs> what is it like working for that type of oh, person? Jim is an absolute genius. Um, I mean, I'm not far behind him. I mean, his IQ is probably 170, mine's 145, so it's not that bad. Um, but he was, he was a genius, and, and he wanted to be, <laughs> hey, Jimmy, it's okay. He wanted to be eccentric. He longed for that. He wanted that label put on him. And so he, he played it, and it was, it was great. It was quite funny, it was great fun, and I teased him about it. So are you eccentric today, Jimmy? And, but he was in a roundabout way, like he was living in this, when we first got together, he was living with six other guys in this, and a girl in this horrible, oh, and he was living in the kitchen. That's where his bed was. And I said, well, didn't people want to go into the refrigerator? He goes, oh, no, nobody goes in that refrigerator. And I said, why not? I opened the door. Oh, you've never seen any, it was a science project. Mold, strands of mold were going across. It was like, I'm going, oh my God. And Jim goes, close it. I said, no kidding. But it was, it was like some weird science project. But I moved Jim out of the kitchen into his own apartment uh, because I got us a publishing deal, which was unheard of at the time. But 
the publishers saw what was, could happen and did happen. And there was a few people out there that understood what we were doing. And so I got Jim $25,000 and we moved him into an apartment and I helped move him up there. I moved the boxes up the stairs and put them over here. And I said, Jim, can I, you wait for the, just put them there. I go, okay. He goes, I'll get to them. So I went back up there a year later and the boxes were in exactly the same place. <laughs> now Jimmy's bed, he had a, there was a walk-in closet. He took the doors off. It wasn't a, it's sort of a walk-in closet. He took the doors off and he put a king size mattress in there. Just big enough for a king size mattress, wall to wall. Mattress wall, mattress wall. And a TV, a big giant, big screen TV at the end of the bed. That's Jim Steinman. Was a maniac for television. Loved TV. How he could be that smart and watch that much TV, I'll never know. Because they always say, if you watch that much TV, it'll dumb you down. Well, it didn't dumb him down, but it's one thing his mother did before she passed away, we went to lunch with her. Either the end of 74, 70, the end of 73, 74, had to be in 74 because I was back from, we were doing Rocky Horror on Broadway. And I went to lunch with her and Jim, me, and she looks at me about halfway through lunch. She goes, you know my son better than I do. That's a heavy statement for a mother to lay on you. And sitting here today, I would not disagree with her. Because in the studio, Jim and I were, I mean, he had, he had spaghetti dinner at four o'clock in the morning with two bottles of wine. And stayed awake till seven and woke up at three unless I got him up at two and would get up and walk around for four and be out at seven and come back in and, that was his routine. I won't tell you what else went on, but that's okay. Um, you don't need to know that. So, anyway. Um, what? Oh, so, extraordinary human being, no. Extraordinary. And truly, I did not have a brother until Jim and I got together. And I now have a brother, and his name is Jim Steinman. And I, I can't talk about it anymore because I will start to cry. Okay? All right, Dave, we got time for one more question. Anybody want to ask it? Don't come in here thinking you're getting me off the stage. You're not. Okay. Far side. Um, it's a weird question, but um, would you ever think... Like, like, do you still like write music? And if so, would you do like a collab with another band, which would be sort of funny? Say They're, it again. Um, I have my favorite band is Corn, and I was just wondering if that, like, that would, that would be like just a funny mix, just me, Meatloaf and Corn. Meatloaf and Corn, yeah. They, I, they've, they've, they, there's been some people that have written about Meatloaf and Corn. Trust me, I've seen that. Uh, I don't know their music. I'm sorry, I don't know it. Um, but now I have to go listen to it because of you. Oh, God. Okay. It's okay. So, anyway, he, so, way back there. All right. We'll get you right here. The last question, everyone. Just real quick. Uh, when you did... Uh, I don't do anything quick, okay? <laughs> no, when you did Fight Club and you had, were working with Edward Norton and... Uh, Go ahead. Say it again. When okay. you were working with Edward Norton yeah. and... Uh, Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. And Helen Bonham Carter. <laughs> did you get, hold when McCall. you fought with Edward Norton, did you actually ever hit each other? And if you did, who went down first? <laughs> no. The only time I fought with Ed Norton was in the film when we had the Fight Club meeting. Where in the hell you been reading? <laughs> There's a picture on my table of me doing this as, as Bob. And that's right before I fought with Ed Norton. That's the only time I fought with Ed Norton. I got along great with Ed Norton. He's just a strange guy. Most actors are weird. Look at me. So, um, no, there was a, there's a great moment. And I'm walking down the street and it's like the fight club's already started and la 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 la. And I'm walking down the street, I'm walking down with a box of Krispy Kreme donuts. And Bob's eating one, right? 
And here comes Ed. Oh, or whatever. What, I don't remember his character name. Oh. Drop it back in the box. And I, I licked my fingers. Because, you know, Krispy Kreme's got all the sugar on it. So I lick my fingers. And he sees me. He reacts to it. He goes, I go like this. And he goes. And then they, I, we hear cut. Meat. What are you doing? It's David Fincher. I always get meat. What are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Ask Bob what he's doing. Okay, Bob, what are you doing? Okay, eating Krispy Kreme donuts. Well, what did you just do? I said, I don't know. Can we look at it? And then I see it, and that's when I know I'm licking my fingers. I go, well, Bob's getting the sugar off his fingers. Okay, well, don't do that. I go, he's got to. Okay, we'll make it fast. So if you watch the scene, I still do it, but it's a... And, and Ed still goes, and we shake hands. But I never fought with Ed Norton except in the movie as the fight. And I beat him really quick. No, I got along great with Ed. It's just, you know, you try to talk to him. You've talked over the scene, and you want to talk more, and he's pretending he can't hear you. Other than that, Ed, I know you can hear me. So you get him back. We went over, we, we were in... Uh, Brad, Ed, Helena, David Fincher, and myself went to several film festivals, and the big one was uh, in, in uh, uh, Venice, the Venice Film Festival. I have never seen that many press photographers in my life. I think they gathered them from the entire world and put them there. It was mind-boggling. There was thousands of them. And they were in these bleachers. I thought it was people. I thought they were fans going to clap. No, they were photographers. It was crazy. And, and I don't remember what happens. They started to give us some kind of award, and somebody objected. And Oh, you can't give that to that kind of movie? Okay. And they were going to give Brad an award, but I, I don't know if they did. But there was all this hubbub about Brad getting an award. But he finally got one, and that's good, because he's a really good actor. People, people didn't give him credit. He's an incredible, incredible actor. Really, he's an actor who is in the moment all the time. So ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. I can never, ever, ever repay all of you for what you have given me. You gave me a life I didn't know I was going to have. And Jim Steinman would say the same thing. So I am in your debt. I am incredibly in your debt. And I say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. Hi, this is Michael Shanks, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. The fate of the universe may depend on it. And have fun, and follow your fandom.